Well, good morning and welcome to LCR this morning. As we gather for worship, we wanted to acknowledge one of the older members in our congregation that had a birthday this week. So Mr. Bruce Porter, who turned 93 this week. So, yeah. I think we can safely say he's the only one who has skinny dipped in Walt Disney's pool when he was a boy up near Los Feliz. Things were different back then. You could do things like that. Um, but Bruce, we honor you and I give thanks for the many decades you've been part of our church and your faithfulness. A reminder that this week for our Lenten work, we will be at St. Simon and Jude as we continue this partnership with the Presbyterians and the Catholics, building the body of Christ in Huntington Beach. So this Friday night's their fish fry. Uh, that starts at five, but if you want to come closer to six and then stay for the speaker, who will be me. If you don't want to stay for the speaker, come at five and then leave before we get there. <laughs> Uh, but I'll be speaking about the second of the Lenten disciplines, almsgiving. So that'll be this Friday at 7 p.m. at St. Simon and Jude, and then the dinner begins at 5. Uh, and if you'd like, we'll have a little LCR contingent as we had at the Presbyterian Church this last week. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You're invited to kneel or sit. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not be a false witness. You shall not covet your neighbor's possessions. You shall not covet your neighbor's people. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, and bring your saving love to fruition in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is from the 55th chapter of Isaiah. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. O God, you are my God whom I see. For you my flesh pines and my full thirst, like the earth parched, lifeless and without water. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Thus have I gazed toward you in the sanctuary, to see your power and your glory, for your kindness is a greater good than life, 
My lips shall glorify you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Thus will I bless you while I live. Lifting up my hands, I will call upon your name. As with the riches of a banquet shall my soul be satisfied. And with exultant lips my mouth shall praise you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. You are my help, and in the shadow of your wings I shout for joy. My soul clings fast to you. Your right hand upholds me. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. The second lesson is from the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. The word of the Lord. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. 
or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, hopefully you've seen in our app, the LCRHB app, that on our daily devotions we've had some new faces of people in the church. Uh, I'm looking at some of them here. And it's just a reminder that it's wonderful that you can each bring the word to each other. And that's actually a great way for you to get to know other people too. Uh, it's also a way for you, if you're tired of listening to me, to get a different perspective on the, on the word for the day. And when we were at the Presbyterian Church this past Thursday, we just sat and listened to four chapters of the Gospel of Luke. And it was such a reminder how difficult it is to be still in the presence of God. And you're like fidgeting, you're bored, you're distracted, you want to check your phone, you wonder what's happening. Yeah, and it's like, no, just sit. Like, eat, this is the food of God, eat this word. And it's like, well, yeah, well, how can I eat this word when the sun's shining in my face? You know, like you just, your mind is constant, my mind is constantly churning. But then to rest in God's word uh, is the food that nourishes and the food that does satisfy. I said to you last week that this is the last day to bring food for Robin's Nest. We'll be taking that food this Thursday. So if you didn't bring it today and you still want to bring it, there's still time. Uh, but you'll see the little stockpile we have in the back. And I know Robin's pleased for uh, what you've given. So thank you for that. And a reminder that as part of your Lenten work, you can give them a financial gift. We did uh, $40 for 40 days, just because that seemed to make sense. Um, but you can give that or something else. But the idea is, how is it that we use our wealth to support the work of building community and helping those uh, who need support on their way of becoming. Now, one of the things that I wanted to say too is as we continue coming out of the Omicron time and hopefully have an extended, a long extended period of normal life, we're thinking about different ways that we can return the service back to its fullness, different ways we can add new opportunities uh, for people who are working uh, new Bible studies, new fellowship opportunities. Um, so you may be asked for some feedback in the coming weeks for ways that you would like to engage, if you would like to engage. And if you're happy with your level of engagement, then don't fill it out. That was easy. Uh, well, we have that very famous phrase in the prophet Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heaven is above the earth, so are my thoughts and ways higher than yours. That seems to be both good news and bad news. Good news because the one who created everything, including the earth and the sun and the solar system and the galaxies and everything, the one who created all this thinks about us. So that's good news. The bad news is we're not sure what those thoughts are, at least by our own nature and rationality. We are not able to penetrate the divine mind. You think of a book like Job, where Job, Job goes, oh, I can't wait to talk to God. And then when Job talks to God, he's just like, well, that didn't go the way I thought. That didn't go the way I expected. It's been one of the critiques of religion in the West for at least 130 years, that one of the great temptations of modern people is merely to take human ways of thinking and to magnify them and to assume that that must be what God thinks, because it's just human thought on a grand scale. God's just a bigger version of us. And Jesus tells us, and Isaiah tells us, and other people tell us, that that's simply not the case. God's way and God's thoughts are different. And in case you want to know, though, the prophet Isaiah did tell us what God is leading us towards, which is mercy. So I can spoil the ending right now. It's not like God's thinking is impenetrable to the idea we don't know what God's up to. God is up to being merciful, and the invitation to return is the invitation to connect to that mercy. 
But then if we go, well, yeah, but God, what are you really thinking? God goes, no, just take the mercy. You know, live as a human being, live as a creature, let God be God, but at the end of this story is mercy. Well, we have trouble with that, especially when we're confronted with difficult questions. We had the Galileans whose sacrifices were mingled with blood by Pilate. So imagine going to church and someone pulls a gun. You know, churches everywhere do security briefings and they say, what would we do in an active shooter situation? What would happen if this happened and that happened? So you have this reality that we're a soft target in the security parlance of the world. What would we do if someone came and mingled our blood with our sacrifices? People would go, well, I'm glad that didn't happen at our church. That's kind of what's in the gospel today. The people going, well, I know we don't know why it happened, but we're glad it didn't happen to us. The same thing with the tower in Siloam that falls and crushes the people. They go, we don't know why it happened, but we're glad it didn't happen to us. But when bad things happen to other people that we feel threatened by, we try and come up with some container of explanation that will somehow create some distance from that danger so that we're not immediately affected. And oftentimes the human tendency, which we sometimes project onto the divine mind, is the idea that somehow someone must have been at fault. Well, this wouldn't have happened if there wasn't some moral deficit that we don't know about. Or we just go, you know, God can do whatever God wants. And so whatever, you know, if God wants to crush people with a tower today and be nice to someone tomorrow, that's up to God. And then as we go back to Isaiah, we have to remember, Isaiah didn't say, return to me, otherwise I'll crush you with a tower. He just said, return to me so I can be merciful to you. God is not interested in this kind of violence, whether it's the violence of nature or the violence of human beings. God has a particular end in mind. And so Jesus says, all of this moral calculating and all of this trying to create distance between you and disasters and hardship, struggling with the vulnerability of being alive, you're on the wrong track. You're on the wrong thought process. This is why later on in the New Testament, Paul will say something like, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, rather than having a heart transplant, having sort of a brain transplant, if you want to put it that way. And it's not even just the organ of thinking, it's the whole process of thought, which is rooted in mercy. And one of the dangers of the conversation the people are having with Jesus is they're putting their attention onto other people's lives and not on their own. They're going, I wonder what that person did that something like that happened to them. Or I wonder what the circumstances were. You know, sometimes we even just play it out. What if they had left five minutes later? What if they had left five minutes earlier? What if they had been sick that day? You know, we start to do just a lot of what ifing and sort of fantasizing because again, it gives us some way to feel like we have some way of uh, controlling these situations. And Jesus goes, no, focus on the work, which is repentance. Focus on the work, which is return. Focus on the work, which is feeding on God's mercy. Not feeding on your own opinion of your neighbors, not feeding on your own interpretation of events, feeding on the mercy which God has promised us in Christ. I got a text from one of our young adults this week who's at college, and she goes, I just talked to one of my grandparents and they really kind of freaked me out talking about current events and using the Bible to interpret current events. And I go, well, the point of the Bible is not to make you afraid. And the point of the Bible is not to be some sort of seer stone that you look into and make predictions about. It's a series of texts and witnesses and history that says in the middle of history and in the middle of trouble, God will feed us mercy. And you can rely on that and you can build a life on that. And we need people who aren't occupied with making each other afraid to be in our communities doing holy work for the sake of building up where we live and who we're with and what we're about. Now, I do recognize that in some ways I have engaged a dangerous task, which is we heard Isaiah say, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. And then I go, well, here what, here's what God's thinking, you know, because uh, of course I can't just leave it and just say that I do have to give you a sermon of some kind. Uh, but it's interesting because when Jesus starts to unpack this, he doesn't go here, let me tell you what I mean. He gives them a parable. And this is classic Jesus teach which is also that Jesus will give us a multifaceted meaning or a multifaceted presentation with multifaceted meaning so that he's not just going, look, here it is and here's what it means. 
You know, in our time, we like that. We don't like nuance, and we don't like to go, well, what does that mean? We want, you know, we're getting so much information, our brain just wants to take it, classify it, and move on. And then Jesus goes, here, let me talk to you about a fig tree. And it's like, what? can't you just tell us? He goes, no, I'm going to give you a parable. And the parable will allow us to go from different angles um, to understand a little bit of what God is up to. Now, this parable is very famous. Someone grows a fig tree in a vineyard, and then the fig tree is not fruitful. You heard the whole story, so I don't have to rehearse it. But one of the things Jesus doesn't tell us is, so who exactly are we, and who are you, and like, so what are you telling us about this work of repentance? Because we know for sure that's what he wants us to do, because he told the people who were engaged in this kind of questioning about current events and the tragedy of current events, he says, well, just think about yourselves in your own work of return and feasting on God's mercy. And there are, of course, at least three dimensions that we can talk about. Now, for anyone who's ever been in a vineyard or grown vines, you'll know that sometimes they plant other plants in the vineyard, sometimes for decoration. Sometimes plants are planted in vineyards as an early warning system, like rose bushes, you know, because the rose bushes are more sensitive to like a powdery mildew or other, you know, so if the rose bush gets sick, you can treat the vines before the vines get sick. So the, sometimes the trees are for, um, you know, a kind of early warning system. Uh, but for whatever reason, this vine dr or this planter decided he wanted a fig tree in the vineyard, and maybe he just really likes figs. That's something we have to kind of overcome in our Western utility. We go, well, this, if we have it, it has to have a purpose. And it's like, well, maybe God just likes figs. Someone said that about beetles. If you look at all the creatures that exist on the earth, I mean, there are more beetles than there are anything else. So someone goes, apparently God likes beetles. He's made so many different varieties of beetles. And then you go, well, why, why? And go, he just likes beetles. That's just something he likes. Um, so we have this story, and you need to know that when you plant a fig tree, uh, especially there, but anywhere, that even at the very beginning of the planting, you can start trimming it with the idea of growth. You're forecasting growth by how you trim. Now, you could let the fig tree grow wild, and the fig trees do grow wild, but by growing wild, some of the growth that would be put into the fruit gets put into branches that you didn't really need. And so from the very beginning, you can begin this work of trimming for the sake of fruitfulness. And this is really important when you think about the Lenten discipline of fasting, for example. It's this idea that we are looking to concentrate growth in certain areas of our lives spiritually. And whether we do the trimming, which is do this work of return, or whether God does the trimming, which is I love you and I want you to be fruitful, there will be things that are trimmed out of us that are growing. It's not that they're not growing, they are growing. But they're being trimmed so that we can force growth. And not force growth, but encourage fruitfulness in the areas we want to see fruitful. We're doing this in our staff meetings, we're doing this in our council meeting, are there things in our church as we're coming out of COVID that have just sort of grown wild during this COVID time that aren't bad, but we need to trim because we want to see fruitfulness in our youth program. We want to see fruitfulness in our adult education program. And so what do we trim so that we can concentrate growth? That's why one of the characters in the story is the vine dresser. The vine dresser's whole job is to encourage growth by knowingly trimming and lovingly trimming to make the plant healthy, to encourage the roots to go down and to encourage annual fruitfulness. So this is something to think about with your Lenten discipline. What are the areas that either you are being invited to trim or that God will trim, but for the sake of fruitfulness, not for the sake of vindictiveness, not for the sake of punishing, but for the sake of growing fruit in the areas that are meant to be fruitful? Well, we know in the story that even the trimming hasn't mattered because the fig tree is still not fruitful. And so the owner rightfully says, well, trees are meant to be fruitful, or why are they here? And so cut it down. And the vine dresser who knows and loves the tree sees potential in a tree that has not borne fruit. And now it's not so much an issue of trimming the tree as it is an issue of analyzing the soil. How healthy is the soil for growth? This is also an important conversation for us to have. When we think about Huntington Beach, for example, how healthy is the soil here for people to grow? Yeah, someone's going, not very healthy. Yeah, you know, they used to, with the Santa Ana River, when it was this big river bed, you know, and we had celery farms and beet farms, you know, there are all sorts of farms, lima beans, Bill Kettler, who was here for his 100th birthday, lima beans everywhere. And then once oil was discovered, 
you know, pulling all that oil out of the ground, the, the, and I mean, as we have a toxic waste dump two blocks from the church. Um, it's this idea that the ground isn't very healthy for growing fruit that you would eat. Like we've talked about growing a little vineyard here at the church, but I'm kind of afraid of what it'll pull out of the ground into the grapes. You know, you all have chromium in your, in your communion wine. Uh, but it's an important question to say, is the soil conducive to growth? Is the soil conducive to fruitfulness? Because you'll notice the vine dresser doesn't say, well, let me trim it one more time. Let me reshape it. The tree's been shaped, but now we need more nutrients. We need more nutrients in the soil so that the tree can bear fruit. And if we know that the soil's not good, sometimes we have this work of vine dressing, which is how do we fertilize areas around people so that they can grow the way they're supposed to grow and be fruitful the way they're supposed to grow fruitful. This may sound strange to you, but here we're not using manure. We're using boxes of mac and cheese, cans of SpaghettiOs, stuffing, stuff at Robin's Nest, donating money, you know, those kinds of things. Working with the city, working with the police department, working with various agencies that are trying to build uh, continuity. We were invited by the Huntington Beach Youth Shelter, which is over in the library, to do a day of service at the end of April with the Interfaith Council, so we'll have a day of service at the end of April. It's this idea that we can be people who are fertilizing the ground and not salting it, not poisoning it, not making it difficult for people to grow. And some of the stress that you encounter when you talk to people who live in Huntington Beach or Orange County is they feel how stressful it is to be able to live here. And so how is it that we help create ground that can be fertilized to grow? But it's not just us, because maybe we're not the vine dresser, maybe it's God. So how is God fertilizing the ground so that God encourages growth? How is it that God sees what's been trimmed and shaped, and God goes, no, we don't need to cut down, we need to enrich. And this language of cutting down, especially in vineyards, is very reminiscent of Jesus in the Gospel of John when he talks about lifting up vines, not destroying vines, but lifting them up so they don't take root in the wrong place. God is very intentional about where we draw our nutrition from and if we need more nutrition to give it to us. But God may give you some manure to spread around as well. My mother used to say that. She was a therapist for the army for 40 years. She used to tell some of her clients, especially some who were carrying very heavy psychological burdens from their service in the military, she'd say, well, you've been given this big pile of you-know-what. It's either going to stink up your life or you're going to spread it around and fertilize everything. And so decide, you know, you get to decide what to do with it. You have the pile, you don't get to decide that. You do get to decide whether you spread it around or whether it just stinks up your life. And that's very similar to what Jesus says carrying the cross. You're going to be given a cross, you don't get a choice. But how we carry that cross and what that work is, is part of our discipleship for how God feeds people with mercy, rather than cutting them down or just poisoning the ground in which they live. And then the final part of this is just this idea of fruitfulness. God's not so interested in whether we're grapes or figs. God is interested in seeing fruitful human lives, nourished with mercy, nourished with the grace that comes from Jesus. Even in the poison ground of the cross, in the poison tree of the cross, that dead wood, God grows the fruit of resurrection. And if God can grow the fruit of resurrection in that dead place, God can do anything with our lives to make us fruitful as well. And that's why in the gospel you'll hear another curious story of a man who is moved by the message, who ends up standing in a tree to see Jesus. You'll remember that story of Zacchaeus. And it's so perfect that he goes into a fig tree. It's another version of a fig tree, another brand or a breed or whatever. I'm not a planter, gardener. Uh, But Zacchaeus standing in that tree is a perfect example of human fruit. That God's word is moving people, nourishing people, and they're the fruit that God wants. You see, in the vineyard of the church, God wants you. You're the fruit that God is trimming, shaping, nourishing, and desiring to be fruitful. And he will not cut you down. He will keep digging around you, putting manure around you, fertilizing you, so that you can bear the fruit of grace, and you can bear the fruit of discipleship. Again, if Jesus can do that with the cross and that cross, there's no life, God can take the jumbled nature of our life and all the loose ends, and God can make them fruitful. And God can even make us fruitful in our own dying. There are three people in this city who are calling the church because they're dying. One of them wants me to call him once a week so that he can work through his dying in a spiritual way. That's also being fruitful. He knows he's going to be trimmed by death, but he trusts that God will make him fruitful 
in his dying. And indeed, that's the promise of resurrection. So as we continue on this Lenten way, we give thanks that God's thoughts and ways are different than ours, because by God's thinking and by God's doing, we have this very unexpected alchemy that indeed even the dead are fruitful. Even in places that are unexpected, there is life because we've been fed by mercy. Amen. You're invited to stand. Let us now confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers today, we also want to remember Tad Trout's mother, Mary. She became suddenly ill, and he and Debbie flew to Texas yesterday, and so they've asked for prayers for his mother. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you know how fruitless we are. You know the thoughts we have that are anything but merciful. And yet you still bring life from these dead places. We thank you that your mercy can enfold our faithlessness. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Grant, O oh Lord, that we might share your mind. Grant that we might share your heart. Grant that we might engage in work that is self-giving and redemptive 
humble and kind and gentle. Endow us with your Holy Spirit that these things might be possible, that we might live by your breath and your power. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our community, for people who are living separate lives, for people that don't belong to each other as neighbors. We pray, O Lord, that your communities of faith, for people that bear your name and people of goodwill, that we might engage in this work of bridge building, trust building, and belonging to one another in community. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who have fallen ill suddenly, especially for Mary, for Tad and Debbie as they have traveled to be with her. For those who are being treated for illnesses, for Inga, Mike, John. For those who are nearing death, especially for Anne and Chuck. Also for our sister Mary Catherine. Also the names we lift to you now, silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. For the nations of the earth, especially for places of turmoil and trouble, we pray for Ukraine, we pray for Nigeria, we pray for every place where there is violence and generational distrust. May your Holy Spirit come and renew the face of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are struggling with mental illness and addiction. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are living with the trauma that comes from broken intimate relationships for people struggling with trouble in marriage and trouble between parents and children, parents and grandchildren, Lord, in your mercy. Grant, O Lord, that we might feast on your mercy and extend it to those around us, that they might taste and see that you are good. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with the Holy Spirit lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. 
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered, feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, almighty and merciful Father. You are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world, to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take this cup, all of you, and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again, remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine that by your Spirit we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace and receiving the forgiveness of sin be formed to live as your holy people and given our inheritance with all your saints. For it is through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom, O Lord, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The power.
Return to me and I will feed you with mercy.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away for bread for the give ourselves away as bread for the hungry, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.